Hello, this is Chrononauts, and we are back. This is part two of our second installment on artificial intelligence and machine life, I suppose you could say. And uh, if you want to listen to some really cool background on EM Forster, as well as the really awesome story, The Machine Stops, go to part one of this episode block. But now we're going to talk about first and I don't know, I don't know if we'll be doing any other writers from the Czech Republic, but this is our first Czech writer anyway. Yeah, I would like to. I found some paper on the history of Czech and Slovak science fiction, and it yeah. really starts to get going after World War II. So I'm not sure how much stuff there is out there from this era, but it would be cool to find more for sure. Well, there isn't much, I don't think anyway, but there is, of course argument to be made for some of Kafka's stories, maybe. Right. Yeah. Mm. But Kafka did not actually write in Czech, so I guess I'll proceed this by saying although I am somebody who believes that when you, I guess, speak names that are uh, derived from tongues that you don't know, you at least do your best to try to pronounce everything correctly. I will probably be butchering some of the Czech things here, but I'm also <laughs> deliberately going to avoid saying too much because, yeah, I just, I don't want to butcher everything. So, but we'll do our best here. When I get into a little bit of the background of our man today, Karl Chopek. And according to Chopek's biographer, Ivan Klima, there really wasn't any significant prose literature in Czech until the mid 19th century and very little poetry until the 1830s. Klima argues that the most significant three early 20th century writers after Jan Neruda in the Czech lands were Jaroslav Hazek, author of The Good Soldier Spike, Franz Kafka, who wrote most of his stuff in colloquial German, and Karl Čopek. Karl Čopek was born in 1890 in a northeastern mining town in Bohemia. Male Svatanovice. Apparently, the town was also home to a health spa, a breast cure and all that. Nothing like the odors of a mine to bring out the good health in people. <laughs> Carl was the youngest of three siblings, all of whom were creative individuals in their own right. Their father was the physician for both miners and health seekers alike, and while he may not have been around as much as he could have been, and seems to have neglected his wife somewhat, Karl respected him greatly. The senior Chopek, being a country doctor, was privy to and exposed his children to all walks of life available to them, from the homes of rich barons to impoverished slaving of workers' huts, and Karl and his siblings saw it all. At this time, the nation of Czechoslovakia did not exist, Bohemia being part of Austro-Hungary, but Karl was brought up steeped in Czech folklore and traditions, much of which was fed to him from his father and maternal grandmother. Čopek suffered from ankylosing spondylitis his entire life. It's a progressive spinal arthritic condition that makes walking extremely difficult and it prevented him from fully turning his head, and he suffered from debilitating back and joint pains, and was generally weakened by this condition, and doctors told him it would only grow worse as he aged. He used a cane, which some thought an affectation, because that wasn't an uncommon one among gentlemen at the time, but it was actually a mobility aid. Yosef was the elder brother, a painter considered to be part of the avant-garde school and his ideas about art influenced Karl. Josef was also an author in his own right, and composed a few novels of an apparently experimental style, but I don't really know anything about those. But Karl and Josef remained close throughout the former's life, and the two of them collaborated on some early writing projects, as well as studying at the Sorbonne in Paris in the early 1910s together, and working on the same newspapers. Karl had been expelled from high school, reportedly for being part of an underground patriotic society, though later in life he would repudiate most nationalistic sentiments, even in his homeland. And from that point on, he moved all over the place, relocating 
to Brno, where his sister lived for a time before moving to Prague, where he finished his high school education. And he went to Charles University, the same university as Karl Hans Straubel, probably around the same time, where he majored in philosophy. And he was very influenced by his brothers and the idea of, I guess, the modern art style. And I'm just going to, for my first quote, because I think it's kind of cool, this is what Chopek wrote in an essay about modern art when he was a young student, probably in Paris. But one day, the art lover will come to understand the new art, and then that moment, something better and more valuable will fall into his lap. The new art will appeal to him as naturally and inevitably as what he holds dear today. For modern art is not here to be understood, but to be appealing, to be beautiful. Never was art capable of so many nuances and kinds of beauty as now, when the most robust, refined beauty fits into the frame of a single point of view. It is as if we were deciphering a system of signs. Suddenly what till now were letters turns out to be a personal confession, points of view, and experience. Carl did illustrate some of his own books later, specifically many of his works recording his travel experiences in Europe and his grand work on horticulture, The Gardener's Year with drawings described as being witty and fun. Like many of our writers, Karl Chopek was involved with newspapers, getting his first job on a paper in 1917, and continuing to be involved in journalism for the rest of his all-too-short life. Sometimes, so say some critics, at the expense of his artistic career. Chopek believed strongly in journalism, saying that it helped him polish his writing and also kept uh, him in touch with the development of the times. Joseph and Carol's first collaborative play was The Fateful Game of Love. Not considered a masterpiece, but they worked on many together, and Carol worked fast. And all things considered, I think he was actually quite prolific in his 48 years of life. But yeah. the First World War changed everything. Carl wrote, Shipwrecked and swept away was the world of the young, pre-war Europeans. Swept away was trust, civilized optimism, naive activism, the joyful feeling of cooperation and being part of a community. Both brothers were saved from the front by physical conditions, Josef by poor eyesight, and Carl by his progressive spinal condition. His dissertation in 1915 marked the official end of his studies and was entitled something like The Objective Method in Aesthetics in Relation to the Creative Arts, for which he earned considerable praise. He was always considered an exemplary student, unlike his brother Josef, who really did seem more the artist type. But Carl didn't really go in much for writing verse, but after the war, one of the first tasks he set himself was the translation of some modern French poetry into Czech. He considered this to be important work. Chopek's translation was considered hugely successful and trendsetting, with many budding Czech poets writing of the influence of his translation, and it's even considered the spark that began the modern Czech poetry movement. Vitislav Nevsal, a noted surrealist, praised his quote, encroachment into poetry, as if acknowledging that it wasn't his place, but that he had somehow earned it anyway. During this time, and just before the end of the war, he was working on his own stories and newspaper items. His first book of short stories was Wayside Crossings. Chopek considered himself a pragmatist, or was to a point an adherent of pragmatism in the American vein, and he wrote about it at some length and sort of used its tenets for most of his life. And I don't know, I thought this was sort of interesting just because I think pragmatism is something that's been a little bit mis misapprehended and misunderstood in the last several decades. I don't know, maybe the, the actual philosophical side of it sort of has decreased over time and people just think it's like some form of utilitarianism, I guess, or something right. like that. <laughs> but... The way Chopek and, and people of his time described it wasn't like that at all. It's more like 
ultimate tolerance and believing only the consequences of people's actions really matter and that like you shouldn't be arguing over the stuff that people believe because everybody has their own personal truth and like the only important thing is whether the consequences of those beliefs are, are harmful or not and i don't know i can get behind that i think like perhaps even chopek would admit had he lived a little longer that Maybe there's there's a certain time when the beliefs become really important, but I think he was certainly acknowledging that kind of thing as Europe tore itself apart, which was very significant to him, as we'll, we'll get into sure. as we continue. Mm -hmm. But on October 18th, 1918, a new state was created, the Czechoslovak Republic. Karl had spent the end of the war years as a tutor at a Czech duke's castle and writing columns for a nationalist newspaper. And I just have to say, the castle thing sounds really cool. Like, apparently he was just staying at this baron's castle, and this guy was, like, this crazy Czech patriot. And he was, like, I guess tutoring his children or something like that. And it just sounds like something out of Master's Hammer, like the, the Ulemnes yeah. cultist or something like that. Just, like, yeah. set around the same time. Like... <laughs> There's certainly no shortage of gorgeous castles in the Czech Republic, I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> but the Czechs and Slovaks gained their independence from Austro-Hungary with understandable jubilation, but were soon faced with the reality of the post-war situation. Bitter economic hardships, food shortages, and endless ideological fighting. There were incursions from the nearby Hungarians and ideological inroads made by the Soviets. In 1921, Josef was fired from the paper and they moved to Brno, and Karl began working for the People's Newspaper, or whatever that is in Czech. <laughs> he stayed till his death, a mere 17 years later. So things seemed to calm a little in the young nation in the mid-twenties, and the Chopek brothers built a large house together and moved in with Josef's family in tow. Karl became a devoted gardener and started writing about that too. Many articles, gardening with a humorous bent along with his illustrations were published. He started collecting. He was a fan of folk and ethnic music from all over the world and bought up many records. He took up photography and also began observing and raising dogs and cats, maybe a source for some of his many animalistic fables and tales. Chupek was a welcoming fellow and hosted regular Friday gatherings of intellectuals, writers, and such at his home. These salons were quite simulating and popular, and this is where he cultivated a relationship with first president of the Republic, Tomas G. Mazarik. While he wrote significant novels in the early 20s, he began devoting much of his time to journalism and a certain didacticism. A desire to educate the nation was in him, he said. It was not everyone's opinion that Masaryk was a good influence on him. His niece, in her memoirs, said the two men were too much alike and fortified one another's opinions. Perhaps his brother Yosef thought the same thing. Masaryk encouraged Chopek away from literature and more towards journalism, a worthy goal, but perhaps less permanent and artistic. And very concerned with the social and political problems of the young nation was our man, Karl. But, so yes, his three-volume work, Conversations with Masaryk, was an important landmark. And he sat with the political leader, and they had hours and hours of discussion, with Chopek meticulously taking notes about philosophy and politics, and the responsibility of a new democratic state. His relationship with Masary can be considered as something of a mixed blessing. He really admired the older man and found him to be an inspiration. His earlier skepticism was reduced somewhat, and not everyone was without cynicism. He became known as the castle writer to some, and some attacked him, like the critic Vaklovek, who in 1926 wrote, He wants to have calm, balance, happiness, and primarily peace and quiet. He gets most angry with those who disturb his peace, no matter how serious their motives. Basically, however, he has taken a positive attitude only toward the meaningless, trivial lives of the bourgeoisie. In his pessimism about civilization, Chopek demonstrates his kinship with the dying bourgeois culture 
and its feeble vitality, which cannot keep pace with modern times. Tropic's relativism stands in diametrical opposition to the effort of our generation to attain a supra-individual, but nonetheless humane, order. Increasingly, over the next decade, Karl Chopek would face considerable backlash and criticism from both the left and the right, even though he had many admirers whose praise he gratefully cultivated. And it's said that he did not take criticism particularly well, and some that was leveled against him was particularly vicious. It was a very political time, with extreme ideologies on either side becoming loud and insistent, and Chopek was sort of caught in the middle kind of pleading for tolerance and understanding. To some, his stance of disliking revolution and extremity seemed weak and complacent. He was also a bit of a hypochondriac, often talking of his ill health, putting ill health into his characters. Although no doubt his all-too-real illness and chronic pain played a part in this, Ivan Klima traces some of this back to his relationship with his mother, who tended to coddle him in childhood, and practice what might be termed suffocating love. But this wasn't a random observation on Klima's part, and mother's perhaps pathological qualities were commented on by other members of the family, like their sister Helena and the wife of Yosef, other observers, and Carol himself. In this, it's possible that she was compensating for the lack of romantic love in her life, although this was probably unconscious. All three siblings have strong and positive memories of their father, which they recount, despite his frequent long absences. But mother was often silent and depressed, and would communicate with no one but her youngest, Carl. She lived in constant fear for her young son's health, and grew wild at the slightest sign of illness. She didn't believe in her husband's medical advice, nor in that of any of his colleagues. Helena wrote in her memoirs, the only one of us she tolerated near her and would have preferred to imprison within her body once again was Carl. She went to great lengths to tear him away from the rest of the family so that she might have him all to herself. The hysteria of her immoderate love for him made us shudder, and all our lives long we used a self-invented, restrained but at the same time wholesomely racy secret language only the three of us understood. We loved our mother wholeheartedly, but there emanated from her a certain unhealthiness, a hidden world of good permeated by evil, an instinctual propensity for believing more in evil than in good, in the worst of any two things. It was no wonder that in our childish way we searched ruthlessly for a countermeasure and tore Karl away from her querulous, unreasonable love. Chopek's particular family dynamic is often reflected in his work, especially some of his novels. Father figures are strong, big-hearted, good-naturedly grumpy. Mothers are cloying, hysterical, or in some other ways, problematic. Even romantic love is strangely absent from much of his work, except in a parodic or idealized fashion, as we will see shortly. It can certainly be argued that the attitude towards Ozina Chopek, heaping the blame for so much upon her, is a little unfair. Nevertheless, it seems significant that so many had something to say about it. Josef Chopek's wife, Yarmila, wrote, Her lack of emotional fulfillment and her excitability often caused the mother to lash out and hurt the family members in their routine everyday life, and perhaps she was to blame for certain biases, phobias, and misogyny in both brothers. She was immensely gifted and perceptive, and I heard the doctor say that women like her often have sons who are geniuses. So, Moving on from the mother talk, though, he also, that is, Carl, traveled throughout Europe and wrote travel books detailing adventures with drawings he made himself. There was some indication, though, that the cosmopolitan adventurer was a kind of act. While he wrote excited and cheerful letters to his publisher and his public, his letters home to his wife and friends often told of loneliness and sadness. Then again, Carl may have had a tendency toward melodrama. Speaking of his wife, Olga Scheinplugova, she was an actress, and Karl knew her for many years before their marriage, when they spent much time together. He seemed to prevaricate on marrying her, blaming his medical condition. 
During this time, they remained friends, though, and she had several affairs with other men, none of which she hid from him. Carl, on the other hand, only ever had one other woman in his life, again, in the early 20s, and it seems to have broken off quite quickly after she got married. Anyway, the two, Olga and Carl, were almost best friends, and she was an uncritical admirer of his work. Alas, they were only married in 1935 and had a mere three years of domestic happiness together before Carl's untimely death in 38. So the 20s were a very fertile time for Chopek. Are You Are was his second play attributed solely to him and the first to meet with dramatic success. And indeed, it was quite successful being staged internationally and spreading some time on Broadway even where some of our American science fiction writers, like Sprague, were able to see. So the same year, though, R.U.R. was published, 1921, Chubbeck became the director of the Prague Municipal Theater and produced many other plays, like The Life of the Insects, which was another collaboration, The Metropolis Secret, and Adam the Creator. All the plays of this era seem to have fantastic or weird elements to them. After the 20s, Chubbuck didn't write much drama, although he did do a couple more fantastic ones towards the end of his life, like The White Plague, which is supposed to be quite political. So I'll talk a bit more about some of his novels, because I think they're kind of of interest. So we mentioned War of the Newts before, I've mentioned it on the podcast. So it's, it's one of his last works, I think the last completed novel that he published, although there was uh, one that his wife completed afterwards, but... This one is, is basically a story about underwater salamander creatures that humans first going to exploit, and then they kind of end up mastering us. So seems it seems, again, to be a theme here. Sure. <laughs> yes. War with the Newts is really awesome. It's really cool the way the way he writes it with a very broad point of view that, like, you know, and it gets kind of experimental sometimes with a lot of excerpts from scientific journals and papers and different writing styles and, like, all of the reactions to the newts and learning that they have a culture and how some people think that's not a big deal and how others think it's like everything. And it's a very interesting, all-encompassing work. And I would say, although R.U.R. does seem to be the work he's more well-known for all over the world, probably that novel was like, it's probably a better novel than this is a play. Although I did, I do really like this. Yeah, I liked it too. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to cover this, not only because of its historical significance with the word robot, but <laughs> because it is a play. It, it is drama. And yeah. science fiction and drama don't really cross as often as maybe other certain genres do. Yeah, I mean, I guess arguably, I don't know. I, I, guess I see what you mean, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like... We certainly haven't done too many plays on the podcast yet, and I, I really enjoyed doing this. Yeah. I do want to go through a bit more background first before sure. returning to it, but I think that I was really happy doing a play. Like, I yeah. think this, this it was yeah. felt really nice, and, and I don't know, there was there's something different about it, which, again, we'll, we'll talk more about in a few minutes, but... Yeah, it is a different format, you know? It's something that we don't usually cover, and it, there, there doesn't seem to be that many science fiction works in this format at least obviously compared to prose or film i mean yeah. even by this yeah. time 1920 there's not like a huge amount of science fiction films but probably more science fiction films than science fiction plays maybe mm. I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure at least i can't think of any other science fiction plays off the top of my head yeah i mean there's an anacroput uh not an um uh the other works by Gaspar, I guess some of yeah. them, some of them maybe count, but yeah, like he's pretty unknown. So I'm trying to think. I'm sure there were, I'm sure there are more, but nothing is really coming to mind. But I'm also not really that much of a theater person. So yeah, I did read the modernist chapter in the Cambridge History of Science Fiction, and it does actually mention a few. What's that guy's name? Wyndham Lewis, hmm. and maybe something by Shaw. I don't know. But yeah, there's there's not a lot that I can think of either. So, But I really think it's a shame that Chopek is not more known for his novels, probably, outside of the Czech lands. His first novel was called The Absolute at Large in English and was published in 1922. And it has a science fiction concept also of machines that produce an infinite quantity of goods without expending energy. And this basically causes an apocalypse. Uh, his second, Krakatit, 
involves the invention of an atomic weapon, which is pretty cool. Apparently, it's also kind of a romance. So, but it's like one of the few books that he wrote where he actually describes a real love situation. But he also has this trilogy of novels written in the 30s, Hudibal, Meteor, and An Ordinary Life. And these stories played with perspective, presenting the same events through different points of view or perceiving in different, perceives in different periods of time to produce an effect that's supposed to be similar to that described by the film Rashomon. Mm. Chubbuck was an Anglophile who loved and respected English culture, and he was friends with G.K. Chesterton and George Bernard Shaw, and was an admirer of H.G. Wells. The two of them were both members of the Penn Club, and Wells had nominated him. Call was very much concerned with the situation in Europe, as I mentioned before, and Czechoslovakia was certainly caught between two warring beasts, as it were. His book on public matters in 1932, in which he gathered eight years of political and socially oriented articles, he considered to be important. And these included essays like, Why I Am Not a Communist, on relativism, and some cautionary articles about rapid technological progress. He characterized the politics of the time thus, and I'm going to quote him because this kind of reflects how, how he was going towards the end here, but Mutual mistrust, disloyalty, uncooperativeness, blind partisan selfishness and fury, connivance for personal gain, lack of interest in big ideas, an inability to conceive larger solutions, and an unwillingness to take personal responsibility. Political twilight. Elsewhere, he said, Take note. Opposition to democracy is usually coupled with chronic name-calling, with passive pessimism. The opinion that democracy has become outdated usually arises from the gloomy insistence that it's all a lot of dirty dealing. If so, how do you want to improve it? A pile of garbage remains garbage, even if you turn it upside down. And he goes on to attack the communists and also Czech nationalists, who possess strong anti-Germanic sentiments, thus alienating large segments of the population who did not wish to be displaced and would end up aligning with Hitler's Nazis. Later in the book, he speaks more positively of how things could be improved in a general sense, what he would like to see for the good of all and his beloved democracy. First of all, to make sure that people experience neither material nor ethical injustice, to increase the value of everyone's life by striving for a better social and world order, and to tackle it practically without any messianism and without blinders on our eyes, to not take away faith from people, but rather their pain, ennui, despondency, and isolation, to see that people maintain a state of cordiality, mutual loyalty and goodwill, joy and respect, in a word, morality, in a word, optimism, in a few more words, clear-headed, empowered human life. Mere months after the book on public matters was published, Hitler rose to power in Germany. Karl Chopek was not, unlike many intellectuals, too concerned with class struggles or with political and economic causes of totalitarianism. For him, totalitarianism signified a failure of intellectuals. About the rise of Nazism, he had a great deal to say. One entire nation, one whole Reich, has come around spiritually to believing in animism racism, and similar nonsense. An entire nation, if you please, with university professors, priests, writers, physicians, and lawyers. What happened there was nothing less than an immense betrayal by educated Germans. It gives you a frightening idea what educated people are capable of. I could give you more examples, and not only from that one country. Wherever violence is used against civilized humanity, you will find intellectuals, by the dozens, collaborating, and furthermore, brandishing their ideological reasons for doing so. This is not about a crisis of a, or helplessness on the part of the intelligentsia. Rather, it is about a silent or else extremely active complicity in the moral and political shambles of Europe today. In the early 30s, he had been nominated for the Nobel Prize, but war with the Newts was deemed too aggressive, and 
was pretty pointed about attacking Hitler and Nazism in particular. The Nobel representative said, while Karl and Olga were traveling in Scandinavia in 1936, write a book of 300 pages or so, attacking nothing and no one. And Karl said, I thank you for your kindness, but I finished my dissertation long ago. 1938 was obviously a bad year for Czechoslovakia. There were three million Germans living in the new nation, and through the support of a political party directed from Berlin, it seemed that a majority of them wanted to live in the Reich. The so-called Munich Agreement between Germany, Italy, Great Britain, and France basically ceded all of the borderlands to Hitler, destroying the Republic. In particular, Karl Chabek was crushed by British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's capitulation to Nazi Germany, something that he seemed to take as an almost personal betrayal. Chamberlain famously said in a 1938 broadcast, this is a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. Karl Chopek was politically active during this period, delivering speeches to Penn and elsewhere, writing dozens of newspaper articles in what he must have seen as an attempt to bolster the spirits of the people. But as the year went on, things only got worse and worse. There was no place in this land for adherence of democracy. Chopek was attacked in the papers, and false accusations were made against him. Many of his friends tried to encourage him to emigrate while he still could, just as the then president of the Republic had, but he refused. His last work was, well, this was the posthumous novel, actually, was The Life and Work of the Composer, Fultin, a novel about an egotistical, uncreative thief whose only goal was to become a famous composer. He never finished that one. And his last newspaper piece was an article entitled Greetings, which came out on Christmas Day. In it, he reminisced about all the places in Europe he had visited and the interactions he had had with its everyday down-to-earth people. But at the last, he said, What can one do? It is terribly far from one nation to another. We are all increasingly alone. Better now never to set foot outside one's home. Better to lock the doors and close the shutters and let them all do as they please. I no longer care. And now you can close your eyes and softly, so softly say, How do you do, old gentleman in Kent? Grüß Gott, mein Herren. Gratia, Signor. E votre sainte. Chapek died that very day, quite suddenly, of complications related to bronchial pneumonia. While there was little in the way of antibiotics or drugs available in the land at that time, many of his friends and associates believed that Karl Chopek, so overcome by the perceived treachery of the Munich Agreement and the personal attacks in the papers, simply lost his will to go on. He would possibly have been a victim of Nazi persecution had he survived. Well, most likely, in fact. Supposedly he was high up on the Gestapo's list, and they showed up at his house in March 1939, only to find he'd been dead for three months. His brother, Josef, was not so lucky. Josef spent the rest of his life in Nazi concentration camps. He died in Bergen-Belsen in 1945, possibly hours before the camp was liberated. Olga kept going and wrote her fictionalized account of their life together, as well as finishing the novel about Fultin. And... Yeah, that was my rabbit hole for this episode, was getting into Chopek and his life. Yeah, another fascinating figure, mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly a cool body of work. I'm, I'm sure we'll cover War of the Newts at some point. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that at some point. Yeah, I have I have my eyes on War with the Newts for host choice someday, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the one we're talking about now is, of course, R.U.R., and that stands for Rossum's Universal Robots, and that's not a translation. This is a multinational with an English face. Although Rosam may be derived from Rosam, the Czech word for mind or reason. Robota was Czech for heavy labor or drudgery. This is supposedly one of only two Czech words that more or less made it into English usage. The other is pistol, if you're curious. <laughs> well, 
Perhaps a reflection of his general self-effacing nature, but Carl does not credit himself with the term robot. He says this was a suggestion of Yosef's. The world premiere was on January 3rd, 1921, in some town whose name I can't pronounce. <laughs> Sorry. But Wolfstein Amateur Group. And the play was hugely successful. And even though it was an early work by him and arguably eclipsed artistically by some of his novels, it's the work he's most recognized for all over the world, like I was mentioning. By 1923, it had been translated into 30 languages and performed all over Europe and North America. Many artists and performers that would later become notorious had a hand in early productions of this play. The Berlin production of 1923 is supposed to have been particularly noteworthy, as it's commemorated in the Centennial Exhibition in the Karl Chopek Memorial Museum, which was called A Journey into the Depths of the Robot's Soul. The 1923 Berlin production had stage design by Friedrich Kiesler and was considered quite avant-garde, and included some kind of voice distortion effect used on the robot's voices. I wonder how what that sounded like. Yeah, it's too bad that so much of this stuff wasn't recorded just due to the technology not being yeah. available at that time, because it would yeah. really be fascinating to see one of these 1920s performances, like a recording of it. Yeah, I, that would have been really interesting, for yeah. sure. Yeah. There are a lot of adaptations, but like we do have a few, but... Yeah. And there were projection of images onto canvas and flowing water. In New York, a young acting student, Spencer Tracy, had his debut on Broadway playing one of the robots. Over in London, Michael Caine also had a very early role in the play. So I had read this a long time ago. But I didn't remember a lot about it. So mm -hmm. it felt kind of new to me, but at the same time, it was just such a easy read like it's just it's so nice to do a play like this like i yeah. think <laughs> yeah it is very easy to get through it speeds right through yeah i mean it's not that long to begin with but the dialogue is fun it's snappy mm -hmm. um it, while it deals with some heavy themes it kind of deals with them in a somewhat light-hearted way yeah. which makes it a little bit easier to get through. yeah and i think that was kind of chop x thing like yeah mm -hmm. i did read a lot of his short stories in preparation, I guess, sort of to get myself in his mood. Mm -hmm. I didn't really crack any of the other novels, but I just kind of wanted to. So I, I read some of the stories in Tales in Two Pockets and the Tropic Reader. And it definitely seems like, yes, he does kind of get heavy, but he does it with a light touch, like a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. even his melancholy is sort of tinted with this good spiritedness, I think, a lot right. of the time. And War with the Newts, for sure, is, is really funny at times, but it's also like an apocalyptic dystopia, right? But it, but it's at times pretty hilarious, and definitely the first half is like really upbeat, almost in a way, and I uh, well, found a musical production of that one too recently, so... <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I but, guess we'll talk about some of the adaptations we listen to later. Yeah, but... yeah, but this was one of War, War with the Newts, so it seems like... Yeah. Doing musical theater of Chopek is, is not, it has a basis. So. And I actually remembered there being a little music in the play. There isn't really much, just they burst into song at one point, which one of the adaptations did in an amusing way. But yeah, there's, there's not really any songs in it per se. Right. <laughs> but Gretchen, you had read this before, right? Yes. Yeah. And it had also been quite a few years for me. So I also didn't remember much of the specifics about it. It was nice to revisit it, and I, I think it's pretty, it's, it is like we were saying, a very speedy, breezy play to read through. The dialogue is quite fun to read, even though it is describing something that's very, that's pretty heavy and sort of a serious topic. But yeah, I enjoyed rereading it. It's certainly possible to, like, I mean, this another cool thing about a play is that a lot of it is down to interpretation, right? So this could be performed in a way that could be pretty heavy like there's a couple of scenes things get kind of violent and yeah. then yeah, yeah at the end there's there's some <laughs> vivisection going on and stuff but in general yeah it has this fun tone to it that makes it a really pleasant read yeah i mean it is like it starts out very lighthearted, and it does get darker as it goes along but i think it still sort of maintains yeah that energy from the first part nate this is your first read yeah i haven't read this before i've heard about it for a really long time, mainly due mm -hmm. to the fact that it's the first use of the word robot in yeah, this right. context. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so I've been looking forward to reading it for the historical context. But, you know, like I was saying before, it's just cool to read drama for the podcast. And it's not something yeah. we get a chance to do that often. You know, I, I like the short stories and the novels, but branching out to other forms like drama and poetry and things like that is always cool to do. Yeah. I mean, we've only done, I think we talked about this not that long ago, but like the Seagolf, yeah, little Seagolf plays and Star Sigh, maybe like it has, I mean, it has sort of play excerpts in it, which right. are really cool. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's something I'd like to reread one day, actually. Maybe not for the podcast, but just generally to go back to Star Sigh. But yeah, then, then I like the fact that everything is out in the open, like everything is in the dialogue and really interpretation can make a huge difference but mm -hmm. a lot of that is you know even when you're reading a play right you're probably hearing and seeing it being almost performed on a stage in your mind right mm -hmm. and so certain lines might be significant i mean I, re I remember listening to one of the adaptations of this and thinking yeah that's really good but i wouldn't have like i, I wouldn't have thought to say that like that like in that right. way yeah right yeah and it's kind of interesting but so yeah obviously very influential I think a lot of people probably know the story without knowing it kind of thing. You know, they haven't read it, but they know it's a story of Robot Rebellion, more or less. Mm -hmm. And that, for sure, is something you see a lot of, right? I can't remember the first time I came across a, a Robot Rebellion story, but... Yeah, maybe Terminator is the first one that I encountered, the whole Skynet thing. That idea, it, it's... I mean, it plays out I think um, there than here. Power but... of the Daleks is, is pretty influenced by this. Yeah. Oh, um, definitely, yes. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, Patrick Trout and Doctor Who story and it's like they want to exploit them for worker you know make them into workers right and of right, course yeah. not not knowing but of course being Daleks they have an evil scheme behind everything it's just, you know obviously a little different because they're yeah. like malevolent what was it what was it Pert we said bubbling lumps of hate <laughs> <laughs> and these robots are not that yeah and I have a quote from Chopek because I'm not going to read it till the end, but like it kind of talks about what's going to happen. But Chopek was one person, one author, unlike some of our authors, who definitely had a lot to say about everything. I guess one similar would be Wells, I suppose. But even though it's just commenting on his own work, especially RUR, because it caused considerable stir and everybody was talking about it. Like this play was very popular. And afterwards, I'll read the quote, but it, it kind of explains how he thought of this work. And it, it definitely fits in with his philosophy and what we talked about in the background, I think, uh, quite well. So there's the one thing, like, you can tell he was getting more upset and pessimistic about the fate of Europe as he went on. But Chopek was pretty consistent in his outlook, pretty much from, from the time when he started writing. So... Mm -hmm. I don't know, this, like, it's a lot of fun. You can tell it's influential, but, like, it's hard to even pinpoint, like, just the fact that it's the origin of robots, right? And, I don't know, I think automatically, a lot of the time, when we think of robots, we think, oh, they go wrong at some point, and, like, smash stuff and kill their creator <laughs> or something like that. Like, this is just what happens, right? <laughs> even last episode with the automatic house mates. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, though, these are not uh, what we now consider robots. These would be androids mm -hmm. because they're not made of metal and plastic, but in fact, synthetic flesh. And one thing this work gets into is that nebulous concept of the soul and what the soul actually is. Chopik doesn't really have an answer for that, but apparently there's a formula for it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Actually, um, this, this is a really easy thing to summarize because it's just three, well, four, really, four long scenes. Yeah, I did think it was kind of funny that the prologue is by far the longest of the scenes. <laughs> is it? Because the rest, the rest of the scenes are named act, you know, one, two, and three, but the prologue is significantly longer than any of the individual acts. I felt like, really? Okay, interesting. I didn't, I didn't really realize that. I kind of thought maybe act two was the longest, but I didn't do a word count or anything, so, or page count. But yeah, that takes place like well before everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently there had to be a break after the prologue so that the actors could get like painted up to look older. Perhaps the prologue was longer so that it was worth it to not suddenly come out with the, the makeup. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, true. That's that's probably why it was longer then. 
because you know you don't want to give people a uh, timeout too early, right? So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's basically just a bunch of long scenes of people talking, and some stuff happens for sure, especially towards the end. I don't know. It was very easy when it's all dialogue sometimes, and that's I don't know that easy to summarize for sure. So I'll begin. So the posters of the play said this was somewhere around the year 2000, but that's never stated anywhere in the actual production, which takes place on a quiet island where there is a factory. And this factory manufactures labor machines, or robots. The Rosom's Universal Robots Corporation staff all seems to live on the island, and their general director, Domin, is pumped up with propaganda about his machines. There are times when it seems like he's reeling off advertising copy. Helena, the daughter of the president, nation unknown, is visiting the island and has an interview with Domin. First she thinks Domin's two attendant robots, Marius and Sola, are papal. Then, when he introduces her to her actual staff, Hallmeyer, Gall, Alkvist, Fabry, she thinks they are robots. And there's some fun misunderstandings which basically make yeah. up the majority of this <laughs> prologue. <It's a> typical <laughs> dramatic misunderstandings. <laughs> this is pretty funny. And there's a lot of like funny mannerisms like all the men sort of milling around Helena and they're always telling her to take a seat. And it's like it never says that she stands up but I kind of picture like, like she must be getting up and pacing around the room or something. It never says that. But the characters are always, the men are always telling her to take a seat. She's restless. And she's always moving around and maybe that makes them nervous. <laughs> but before the misunderstandings wholly cleared up, she reveals that she's actually here on behalf of the League of Humanity, which is interested in fighting for the rights of robots. Domen insists that they have no souls. Everyone just seems... So excited by having a real life woman on the island, and they can't do anything but be happy. And all the men except Domin go off to make lunch. Apparently, the robots, artificial creations mixed from batter, have no sense of taste, and so aren't the great cooks that they could be. They have a project to introduce pain to robots, though, since at times they overdo things and injure themselves. They also go crazy have sometimes and have to be melted down or recycled. Otherwise, though, they're near perfect. Domen briefly explains how the old Rosum had the idea of creating life from scratch, and his idea was to create actual humans. He wasn't successful at this, though, and his son didn't think it was an awesome idea anyway. So his son was more practical and used the synthesis to make soulless machines who would work for nothing and could be produced very cheaply. Helena feels sorry for the robots, who are designated male and female but have no sense of attraction to each other. But she's also confused by her sensations. Conflicted about whether she should loathe them, envy them, or feel bad for them. Domin, though, despite his enthusiasm for robot tales, insists that he's very human. He does this by abruptly asking Helena to marry him. If she won't have her, he says, at least let her take one of the others. And she thinks he's gone a bit crazy. And he says, yes, and that's how a man should be. And she's saved from having to give an immediate answer by the arrival of the staff with lunch. But this is where it goes ten years into the future, 
from the day of the preceding scene. And in the play, the makeup's been altered accordingly. So Helena has stayed on the island after all. And she has nice chambers and all the men bring her nice things like Hallemeyer, who has been spending time growing new species of flowering plants. She seems closest to Domin because she married him. Domin now carries a gun in his pocket and they are all concealing from Helena the fact that something has gone wrong. It is eerily quiet on the island and in fact there have been no ships or mail for quite some time. Helena's servant Nana grumps and complains about the robots who still lose their cool regularly. Helena knows them by name and still feels sorry for them, but Nana thinks they're basically monsters. A lot has happened in the world. Workers revolted and tried to destroy the robots. Governments started using robots as soldiers. There were a ton of wars, and in a way, our U.R. should take responsibility. Helena feels frightened and thinks they should all leave the island. Domin warns her not to go outside as he leaves to meet Fabri, and Helena, knowing something is definitely up, obtains the latest newspaper from Domin's room. Sure enough, robot soldiers have run amok and have been slaughtering hundreds of thousands of civilians. Or did the commander just order them to do that? In Lava, there is a robot union, but in very troubling news, humans appear to have stopped giving birth. The race has become sterile. Possibly a week without new babies is a scary thing. Helena herself has been depressed about not having a child. She's sad to learn even Hallemeyer's artificially cultivated and speed-grown flowers are infertile. Nana spouts claptrap about blasphemy and satanic pride, and Helena is just annoyed and sad. She calls in Alkvist, the chief of construction, who is always getting his hands dirty, laying bricks, and has from the beginning expressed doubts about the type of progress the company is making. He loves work and thinks there's greater honor and satisfaction in laying bricks than making plans that are too great. He won't outright admit anything, but he shares Helena's unease and desires to leave the island. He says the human race is sterile because they now live in paradise, tended by robots, and the labor of birth, like all other labor, is unnecessary. Helena speaks to Radius, a specially designed robot, who has recently had what they call a fit. He refuses to work, and been smashing up stuff in a rage. Radius would rather be put to death than accept a master. He has an incredible brain, designed by Dr. Gall. Gall has been steadily improving on robot brains, and the new ones are both smarter and seem to exhibit emotions. He has created a few of them, one of which was sold to Labra. Another is a duplicate of Helena, who wanders about in a daze, and is, as Gold describes, good for nothing, though incredibly beautiful. Radius can do everything, has been working in the library, presumably reading everything, and desires to rule over humans. The men are excited, because after over a week of silence, a boat is finally coming their way. Domin wants to know who incited the robot revolution. He assumes it was human. Speaking of boats, all the men have given presents to Helena on her anniversary day, and Domin's is a boat, a gunboat called the Ultimus. They had plans to leave the island on the boat, but Domin hopes now it won't be necessary. They await news. The men, without Helena's knowledge, had a plan to hang out on the ocean and wait for the robots to come to them, since Harry Domin had been keeping Rosam's production method secret. Unfortunately, Helena has just burned them. They see the boat, the Amelia, unloading parcels of mail and such, and Domin is too ecstatic. Rather than going away, which Helena still insists they should do, he wants to step up production and build more factories. The plan is to have every nation build its own robots and have them speak their own tongues and look different and everything. The theory is that now the robots won't be able to globally conspire. Brilliant idea. Yeah. The more Brave New World reminiscences in this part, I think. I was reminded of the 
part that stood out to me most when I was like reading this for the first time, not this Brave New World for the first time when I was really young, was like the conditioning of the babies mm-hmm. and the, the infants. And they would like sit in this little room or when, when they would be sleeping, listening to broadcasts, telling them mm-hmm. about how they should be happy there are betas and not not and and the gammas those gammas are really terrible aren't they and they're very stupid and like (laughs) but yeah so they they want to build prejudice into the robots and so that they hate each other but it's too late the mail is in fact nothing but pamphlets from the first union of universal robots decreeing that the human race should be exterminated All machines and railroads and mines and factories are to be preserved. The Ultimus is cut off. There are already robots aboard. They're surrounded, in fact, and they hear the factory whistle signaling for the attack to begin. So the men barricade themselves in, and they're still trying to keep Helena unaware of the truth, but she's read the proclamation. She knows. Fabri wants to electrify the fence and keep the robots outside. They're depending on their still being men in the power plant. Each of them is coping in their own way. They notice the Ultimus has its cannons trained on the house. And their debate over what went wrong. Where the crime lay and with whom. Alquist thinks it was making robots in the first place. Domin still stands by what the company did. Talking of how hateful work and drudgery is. He wanted to make all men equal and not have to slave away for someone else. And he's very passionate about all this, and we've no doubt that he believes it all and isn't a terrible person. But, of course, he would have enslaved the robots. Alquist points out that neither of the Rosums cared about any of that. Rosum the Elder was just into creation for its own sake, and Rosum the Younger wanted to make loads of money. Speaking of which... All Bussman can do during all this time is fiddle with his account ledgers. I forgot to mention him earlier, but he's like the the accounts guy. (laughs) He's kind of a nobody character, but... (laughs) We hear him mumbling some to himself as the other men debate. And Helena is playing the piano in the next room. Some robots attempt to breach the fence and the men turn the current on. And we get a repeat of Connecticut Yankee with whole bunch of robot corpses. The other of the men are elated, but Domin oddly expresses a supernatural feeling, like they've already been dead for a hundred years, and they're just experiencing something as ghosts that's already happened. Alquist is raving angry and blaming them all, and it turns out that Dr. Gall altered the robots at the request of Helena, changing their physiological correlate to make them more human. Helena thought this would help them understand humans better and be less inclined to hate. But the effect was quite the opposite, it seems. It's the opinion of Bussman that Gaul or Helena will need a lawyer, Ed Fast. The reason they still have a bargaining chip, the production documentation. They all vote to sell it, with Domin playing devil's advocate somewhat. And Helena keeps trying to interrupt, but they won't listen, and even Domin tells her it's none of her business, and too serious for her. And they treat her like a child. And of course, she's already destroyed the thing. Homer and Gaul remember a lot of it, but the formulation and special biologies and enzymes created by the Elder Rossum are too complicated, and no one knows how to do it. So once again... We have this problem. <laughs> Bossman is the first to crack up and thinks the robots will be interested in the half billion in whatever currency they have stowed away. And he goes out with a big packet of cash and runs straight into the electric fence. Zap. Bye-bye, Bossman. They start exhorting and kind of praying to the light, a shining beacon of ingenuity. Children, it's time to go to bed, Helena says. And with perfect timing, the lamp goes out. Nana comes in. She's been hanging out somewhere the whole time and starts spouting her religious claptrap again. And there's noise from outside. Gunfire, explosions. The men and Helena scatter, each holding grimly to their own attitudes. 
Hollemeyer gets stabbed by a robot who climbs through the window. And looks like Dolman's prophecy is coming true. The robots are led by Radius. And they come in and execute everyone except for Alquist, whom they call a robot because he works with his hands. And they tell him he will work for them. Radius declares robot supremacy and exults in plans of robot expansion. Alquist, now an old man in Act 3, has a lab in one of the factories where he toils fruitlessly to find the secret of the factory, the key to robotic creation, which the Central Committee, again, desperately needs. <laughs> there are apparently no people left in the world, and soon there won't be any robots either. Not even the reflections of man. This whole thing actually reminded me a ton of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep slash Blade Runner? Mm -hmm. Because there the robots are short-lived. The replicants, uh, androids, are short-lived too. And they're, you know, kind of trying to go back to the the nature of their creation. Yeah. Especially in the Blade Runner version. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. The committee talks to Alquist, trying to negotiate. But he's got nothing to give. Daemon, the world leader of robots, one of the early special robot models, says that historical precedent among humans is to kill and rule, and that they had no alternative if they wanted to be like people. The committee says Alquist needs to experiment and dissect live robot subjects. He's horrified by this, never having killed anything in his life. Damon, a leader of the robots, is chosen to be dissected. He doesn't seem too happy about this at first, but soon demands that Alquist keep cutting him as he screams on the dissecting table. <laughs> it's It's... Brutal, but it's also kind of funny the way it's done. Yeah, like <laughs> it's really over the top in like an almost Evil Dead type way of that yeah, plastic. yeah. It's like <laughs> staggering around, bleeding liquid, screaming, yeah. "Cut! Cut!" <laughs> <laughs> Alchemist runs away and straight into Robot Helena. She and Robot Primus examine Alchemist's notes. Helena is more interested in the birds outside. She doesn't feel well, like she's dying. Primus asks if sometimes she too feels that that might be better than living. She says she knows a secret place nearby. A house with an overgrown garden and a family of dogs, which she says is the most beautiful thing in the world, especially the puppies. Robot Helena and Primus flirt sweetly and laugh like young kids. Alquist awakes from a fitful doze and hears this. He's totally convinced that the couple are both people, until they disabuse him. They are both the Mongols' special robots. Only a few hundred were ever made, and those are the ones who must be experimented on. Alquist is ready to dissect Helena, but Primus says he should take him instead. Of course Helena won't have that, and the two determine that they belong to each other. Alquist is touched despite himself, and tells them to leave, to go where they will. He calls them Adam and Eve. Alquist reads from the book of Genesis. On the sixth day, the day of grace, now, Lord, let thy servant, thy most superfluous servant, Alquist, depart. Rosum, Fabri, Gaul, great inventors. What did you ever invent that was great when compared to that girl, to that boy, to this first couple who have discovered love, tears, beloved laughter, the love of husband and wife? O oh, nature, nature, life will not perish. Friends, Helena, life will not perish. It will begin anew with love. It will start out naked and tiny. It will take root in the wilderness, and to it all that we did and built will mean nothing. Our towns and factories, our art, our ideas will all mean nothing. And yet life will not perish. Only we have perished. Our houses and machines will be in ruins. Our systems will collapse, and the names of our great will fall away. 
like autumn leaves. Only you, love, will blossom on this rubbish heap and commit the seed of life to the winds. Now let thy servant depart in peace, O Lord, for my eyes have beheld, beheld thy deliverance through love, and life shall not perish. It shall not perish. And so ends Are You Are in a similar way, I think, to The Machine Stops, really. Yeah. The, the Adam and Eve thing is definitely a theme that plays out in not just these stories, but in a lot of stuff we've covered on the podcast previously. Yeah. I, I don't know. I wouldn't say belabors the point here, but it definitely takes a turn at that the end here towards that. Yeah. Oh, it's not all religiosity, but the idea of rebirth in an almost divine way. Yeah. And I mean, it does seem like the beauty of that and the message of that is the most important thing. Like, and there's no indication that Robot Helena and Robot Primus will be able to reproduce. Like, it may very well be that them going out into the world for a few years might happen, but after that, there won't be any robots either. Like, there's, yeah. it's sort of left mm -hmm. up in the air, right? Again, like the whole Blade Runner thing at the end there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do think that last moment is quite beautiful, though. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that, like, it seems uncertain. Like, like Alquist seems... He's had this, like, almost religious... Well, it is a religious revelation, I guess. But there's no... I mean, I guess I am not necessarily convinced of the truth of that, but that's not important. I feel I'm, like, just being convinced that Alquist believes it is right. enough. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that it kind of helps that the, there's an ambiguity to it. You know, it's like, it seems like Chopik was very interested in, like, belief and how people perceive things. So if Alchemist believes it, I think there's, that is enough. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to read this now. This was published in the Saturday Review, which was an English newspaper. And there was actually a debate that took place in the paper between George Bernard Shaw and G.K. Chesterton after seeing <laughs> Are You Are. Chopek apparently had been reading along with this and he eventually felt the need to chime in. And he felt that both the atheist and the Catholic thinkers had missed something in his work. So he does seem less dodgy. His ideas also may be similar to Butler's here. But he also says... I wish to write a comedy, partly of science, partly of truth. The old inventor, Mr. Rossum, whose name means Mr. Intellect or Mr. Brain, is no more or less than a typical representative of the scientific materialism of the last century. His desire to create an artificial man, in the chemical and biological, not the mechanical sense, is inspired by a foolish and obstinate wish to prove God unnecessary and meaningless. Young Rossum is the modern scientist, untroubled by metaphysical ideas. For him, scientific experiment is the road to industrial production. He is not concerned about proving, but rather manufacturing. To create a homunculus is a medieval idea. To bring it in line with the present century this creation must be undertaken on the principle of mass production. We are in the grip of industrialism. This terrible machinery must not stop, for if it does, it would destroy the lives of thousands. It must, on the contrary, go on. Faster and faster, even though in the process it destroys thousands and thousands of other lives. A product of the human brain has at last escaped from the control of human hands. This is the comedy of science. Now for my other idea, the comedy of truth. In the play, the factory director, Domen, establishes that technical progress emancipates man from hard manual labor, and he is quite right. The Tolstoyan Alkvist, to the contrary, believes that technological progress demoralizes him, and I think he is right too. Helena is right. Bosman, even the robots, are right. All are right, in the moral sense of the word, and they advocate their truths on the basis of ideals. 
I ask whether it is not possible to see, in the present societal conflict, an analogous struggle between two, three, five equally serious traits and equally noble ideals. I think it is possible, and this is the most dramatic element of modern civilization, that one human truth is opposed to another truth, no less human, ideal against ideal, positive value against value, no less positive, instead of the struggle being, as we are so often told it is, one between exalted truth and vile selfish wickedness. These are the things I should like to have said in my comedy of truth, but it seems that I failed, for none of the distinguished speakers who took part in the discussion have discovered this simple aspect in R.U.R. So, again, we have a lot of his moral relativism on display, and I, I guess, like, that definitely comes through in the play. I think even Klima, mm -hmm. like, seems to f be under the impression that he very, very definitively sides with Alkvist. So, I don't know, like, I can see why somebody might think that, but I, he's, you know, kind of trying to deflect that kind of one-sidedness in everything that he talks about. And it's a, definitely a theme of his work. Yeah, I think it is easy to walk away from the play th thinking that Alkvist is quote-unquote the right viewpoint, but it does seem like when reading the play and thinking about it through Chapek's ideals, you can kind of see that there is sympathy for each party. Yeah, there is. There definitely is. Yeah, definitely, like, it just, it really does seem like this really runs through so much of everything that he wrote, which is really interesting. I, I kind of, one of his nicer qualities, I guess, like, it does seem like sometimes he could get a bit heavy-handed with the messaging and stuff like that, but he always had this open-mindedness, I think, that's that's pretty cool to see. Yeah, I certainly enjoy this one a lot. I'm, like we said, it covers some pretty heavy themes, but in a lighthearted and quick way. And it certainly gets really tense during Act 2 there when they're all holed up in the house and the robots are storming them. Mm. The epilogue, I think, was an interesting touch. I didn't really know where he was going to go with it. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that's the best place he could have taken it, but I think overall I enjoyed it and I think it worked for what it is. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of silly for sure, but I I think it knows like that, that he's trying to be lighthearted in his way, yeah. right? He's almost yeah. he's almost similar to Twain in a lot of ways, I think. And, and, and different feeling, but like it's kind of a similar approach of tackling serious issues in a way that's that's kind of seems humorous and amusing and, and and mass appealing in a way. He did refer to it himself as a comedy. So yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even like the whole comedy of errors from the prologue does yeah. feel similar to like the other comedies that I've read, different plays where there's that sort of misunderstanding going yeah, on. Yeah, and a whole, oh, like, you could have made a whole play based around that, you know? <laughs> there's kind of <laughs> mis <and> comic <laughs> misunderstandings yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah, so I guess regarding the plays and performances, I listened to two of the BBC versions, one from 1989 yeah. and one from 2022. Did you guys listen to both of them or? I did listen to both those. I only listened to the 1989 one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, th that's the better of the two, it honestly. Is. <laughs> yeah. The 1989 one is very close to the Chopek text. Uh, there's only some very minor changes mm -hmm. here and there. Uh, we don't get the robot dissection scene, unfortunately. And, uh, <laughs> some of the dialogue is. Just a bit different, you know, localized to... Yeah, for British some reason people. they made Helena the daughter of a professor instead of a president. But yeah. I don't know. But see, here's another thing, too. We read, I should mention, we didn't mention this, but we read the Claudia Novak translation. I think we all read the same one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's apparently different than some of the earlier ones. Mm -hmm. And some of the meanings of things were changed. They go a little bit of that into the introduction, explaining... Some of the well-meaning but not quite right things from some of the early English translations. So. Yeah, I mean, stuff is hard to translate even under the best of circumstances with like these easy, amazing stories type Soviet things that I've been doing. But yeah. translating drama when a lot of it is how the actors play off one another, the rhythm of the words, the wordplay and things like that. It sounds like it would be one of the most difficult things to 
accurately translate and to bring mm-hmm. over in a way that uh, fits and makes sense with what's actually going on in the stage and just seeing two people interact with one another in a way that feels natural in a way that feels like it's actually a conversation being held and not just words on a piece of paper yeah um, for sure so, it yeah. seems like it's got a similar difficulty with like poetry uh, rather than p- yeah. prose right for sure yeah yeah i can definitely see that too yeah mm-hmm. but you know i have to say even with the localization issues and possible translation things in mind the 1989 BBC one does a really good job with the adaptation of it. It's very faithful to the source material and the sound design is really good too. I mean, it's not over the top and it's not, yeah, it's not flashy at all, right? But, but it, it does works. what it needs to do. Yeah. So I could definitely recommend that one quite a bit. The 2022 one. I don't know. I'm not like a musical theater fan and I know some people are. But it definitely takes that approach with it, both in terms of adding a whole bunch of songs to it, as well as it's kind of catchy. It I don't know, I didn't mind it, but that, I think like the, the the it was too different. Like yeah. not just the songs, but just yeah. even like nothing played out. This like I almost it's the kind of situation where I almost think, why did they even put <laughs> Chopek's name to it? Right? Like it's, it's just, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's I appreciate that they wanted to do something different with it because there's actually, the BBC has a long history uh, with this play. The first Mm -hmm. full play performed on BBC radio in 1926 was in fact Mm R.U.R. And Mm -hmm. BBC TV in 1938 did the first broadcast on television and it's considered the first science fiction broadcast on television. So I don't know if that's necessarily 100% true. But it's that's that's what the museum Memorial Chopek Museum claims anyway. So mm-hmm. and if there was anything before, I don't know who would have done it. Like despite the fact that people say that the BBC has a kind of a dismissive attitude about science fiction, they definitely seem to have a long and pretty respected history in it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, especially compared to any of the other major TV studios. At the time, I mean, Quatermass and Doctor Who alone, I think, is mm-hmm. yeah. And in the fifties, there was Journey into Space, and in right. like, yeah, uh, what is that? Into the Unknown TV series, which did a lot of American sci-fi magazine classics, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and then yeah, like the fact that R U R seems to have been important. There was another TV production in nineteen forty-eight. I imagine all these, a lot of these early ones are lost because they're live, mm-hmm. like Probably. they were done live and not recorded. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that even some of the productions of things that weren't live don't necessarily survive with the BBC. Sure. I mean, the 60s, 70s stuff. I mean, Doctor Who kind of, sort of survives in its entirety. I mean, you have the reconstructions based on the surviving audio. But I think there's some stuff of the Avengers that's, like, totally lost altogether. Yeah, season Mm -hmm. one. Most of season one is missing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, There's, there's like, four episodes or something. And, of course, big finish of read out the whole series in audio format <laughs> right? But with different actors. But yeah, the, the whole first, almost the whole first season is gone. Yeah, so. likewise the first Quater Mass, a whole bunch of stuff. I know that in the beginning we were thinking of mentioning Peter Cushing's birthday a few days yeah, ago. Right. Oh yeah. And I know that his run of Sherlock Holmes, several of the serials he did for the BBC have been lost. Yeah. Um, and also a production of Pride and Prejudice where he played Mr. Darcy. Oh, really? Which is kind of disappointing. I'd like to see yeah, that. Yeah, I'd like to see that too. Ah, cool. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. The 2022 version of this, like the, I guess, robot apocalypse with all the humans being dead in the Chopek play happens at like the very end. So yeah. you're, you're probably at like the last 15% or so of the play when that happens, where mm-hmm. as this, that's like the entire second half is post-humanity. And I don't know, that just, they do a lot different with it. And I, I wouldn't necessarily say I enjoyed it, but I guess if you're into the musical theater thing, you might have an easier time with it than I did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's already kind of a silly play, so it, it feels weird to say it's too silly, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> it is silly. very silly. <laughs> did they include the dissection scene in No, that? they didn't. Yeah. Oh, no. I'd like to see a whole <laughs> musical number based yeah. on that. <laughs> no, they, they had a, uh, definitely an opportunity to do something ridiculous with it. They both hint at the fact that it's going to happen but yeah you don't actually go through with it i'll con- conclude this by uh making a nice segue here but the basis for some of the plot was already worked out by carl and Josef as early as 1908 
in a story called The System, which was published somewhere. And here we had an executive named John Andrew Rip Ratten, who <laughs> seeks to alter the system of work to ones that's completely geared toward corporate power. And he states his philosophy thus, Exploit the entire world! The world is nothing but raw material. The world is no more than unexploited matter. The sky and the earth, people, time and space and infinity, everything is just raw material. Gentlemen, the task of industry is to exploit the entire world. Everything must be speeded up. The worker's question is holding us back. The worker must become a machine so that he can simply rotate like a wheel. Every thought is insubordination, gentlemen. Taylorism is systematically incorrect because it disregards the question of a soul. A worker's soul is not a machine. Therefore, it must be removed. This is my system. I have sterilized the worker, purified him. I have destroyed in him, and all feelings of altruism and camaraderie, all familial, poetic, and transcendental feelings. Seems almost more like the story that's to come. I would say so, yeah. Yes. 